football, warfare and other group activities. The concept of games evolved from hunting and warfare. There weren't any rules. You could hardly stand up in the middle of a tribal battle and shout, No hitting in the face, OK? Certain scholars claim that an early form of football occurred after ancient battles, when the victors would kick the heads of their enemies around. Not unlike Millwall after a defeat, or Cantona after that QPR match. Technically, football is a bladder-kicking sport, but a noble one. What could be more important to a well-balanced individual than the sight of an inflated bladder crossing a little white line? What about rugby? I hear some of you cry. Chase the egg is all very well if you want a cauliflower head, but it's clearly not God's chosen sport. If God had meant us to use our hands, he wouldn't have called it football in the first place, now would he? Picture them. Two groups of warriors facing each other across a field of honour, standing proud beneath their chosen colours. The image harks back to a more noble era, an era of technicolour Hollywood films that bore as much relation to history as I do to the Norwegian royal family. Real warfare was brutal and bloody, each man fighting to the last to avoid the prospect of being hacked to pieces and having his head stuck on a pole if he came second. Any chivalry that may have existed was down to the knights, who could afford to be a bit gallant as they chopped up ragged peasants waving pitchforks from the comfort of a bloody great horse inside a nice safe suit of armour. The peasants must have been so overawed by these noble knobheads. They would probably have apologised for getting blood all over the place and bobbed about tugging their forelocks just prior to having them lopped off with the swish of a finely tooled Toledo blade and an aristocratic tally-ho. But what of football? The great game. The sport of sports. We invented football, right? So why do we keep losing the European Cup? I'll tell you. It's because we've made it too easy for all these European upstarts to beat us. What we should do, to keep it fair, is make a couple of minor changes to the rules. First, all European Cup matches should be played in Britain, the home of football. All the European teams that fly over here to play us should be required by law to carry their suitcases and hand luggage personally while they're on the pitch. That should slow them down a bit. Except the goalie, of course. He shouldn't have to carry his luggage because he could use it to block the goal. Cheating bastard. So, you know those eye shades they give you on planes? The European goalie should have to wear those during the game, except during penalties, when they have to wear two pairs. And those little fluffy socks you get, they should have to wear those on their hands. Also, if any of their team members buy duty-free alcohol on the flight over here, they should be required to drink it all half an hour before the game. It's only fair. I mean, our teams are pissed most of the time, so they should be too. And let's face it, we invented the rules of the game in the first place, so we should only use English referees. Ideally, one who has at least two members of his family in the English team. Of course, the Europeans will complain about all this, but they complain about everything. Beef, lamb, pop songs, piss nutters and Union Jack shorts kicking their heads in. They moan about everything we do, so we can ignore all that nonsense. If we can just get UEFA to agree to these minor little changes, we can start singing football's coming home with a bit more conviction. Quips. It's all very well judging mankind by what individuals have done, but much can be learned from what they have said. There are numerous books chronicling pithy sayings declaimed by intellectual giants throughout the ages, so I won't cover old ground. Instead, I've gone for the other end of the spectrum, the dopey one-liners. I have no idea where the majority of this collection of stupid phrases came from. You can probably claim they're yours if you want to. Who knows? They might be. I lost my virginity, but I still have the box it came in. I think... Therefore, we have nothing in common. You'll need to know my name. You'll be screaming it at the ceiling later. Always remember you're unique, just like everyone else. Very funny, Scotty. Now beam down my clothes. Friends help you move. Real friends help you move bodies. The last time I had sex, it was so good, even the neighbours had a cigarette. A good day is when the shit hits the fan, and I have time to duck. The last time I had this much fun, they said I wasn't going to pull through. Be nice to your kids. They'll choose your nursing home. Beauty is in the eye of the beer holder. 
Every morning is the dawn of a new era. I can see clearly now the brain is gone. Look out for number one, and don't step in number two either. 24 hours in a day, 24 beers in a case, it can't just be coincidence. Beware 0 0.666, the number of the Millie Beast. A computer won't stop you being an idiot, but it'll make you a faster, better idiot. Interesting questions. They say a fool can ask more questions than a wise man can answer. This section will almost certainly prove that maxim. The human race achieved its current preeminence by asking important questions, none of which are included here. Why is abbreviation such a long word? Why'd you never get any good news out of an envelope with a window in it? Why didn't Noah swap the flies? Why do people who are served the disgusting pint of off beer always insist that you taste it as well, just so you can see how vile it is? If you've used up all your sick days, is it okay to call in dead? If one synchronised swimmer drowns, do the rest have to drown too? What if there was a lightning flash and it stayed on? Where do female to male sex change patients get their penises from? Can an amateur footballer do a professional foul? Why do they make toasters with a setting that burns the toast? If crystals have healing powers, why are they so hard to swallow? Why doesn't the guy that wins the Tour de France do a lap of honour? Why do world heavyweight boxing champions have bodyguards? If the Beatles were so good, why did they need Oasis to rewrite all their songs? If Paul Daniels is such a good magician, why can't he pull a better wig out of his hat? There is one final question I'd like to leave you with. Why do people believe that aliens, with the technology to cross the fathomless tracks of infinite space, would finally reach Earth and crash and die? Like they can invent the interstellar drive, but they can't come up with seatbelts. Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. The great enigma. Where did they come from? Where did they go? Why were they so bloody big? Mankind has always been fascinated by the concept of dinosaurs. The terrible lizards that seem to have existed before mankind was even a tadpole trying to drag its unevolved body out of the primordial soup that is still being served in certain South London restaurants under the guise of seafood bisque. Throughout history, Curious individuals have dug massive dinosaur skulls out of the dirt and exclaimed, Holy shit! That bastard had a seriously big head! And who could blame them? In later times, Victorian archaeologists attempted to reconstruct these noble beasts from one or two fragments of fossilised bone. The lack of logic and plain common sense they demonstrated in their endeavours can only be put down to the availability of cheap gin and the prevalence of sombre music at the time. However... I can now reveal the secret behind the enigma of the mystery underlying the puzzle that defines the riddle of the dinosaurs. Basically, they're us. The ozone depletion that began in the 20th century became a major problem by 2480, when it disappeared entirely. Mankind could no longer survive on the surface of the Earth due to the intensity of the sun's rays, apart from certain individuals who were descended from an American called George Hamilton, who seemed to thrive on the searing solar radiation that turned normal people into toast. The rest of the population moved underground, and their scientists developed a genetic program to enable future generations to once again walk on the surface of the Earth, even if they were a bit ugly. Using retro-evolutionary genetic engineering, they reinforced genes from mankind's reptilian ancestors and produced cold-blooded creatures with armor-plated skin who would be able to survive beneath the killing rays we once knew as sunshine. The plan was to produce a variety of individuals who could perform specific tasks on the surface that would enable them to generate a force field around the entire planet. This force field would shield the planet from the deadly solar radiation and allow the rest of mankind to emerge from their subterranean exile and screw the Earth up again from scratch. Vast numbers of these highly intelligent genetically engineered creatures were sent to the surface, furnished with the finest technical equipment available. Although they were based, for the most part, on human genes, their reptilian attributes gave them the resilience and fortitude they would require to survive. Sadly, 
there was a fatal flaw in the plan. Once the subterranean enclaves were sealed behind them, they realised they didn't have anything to eat, apart from the three months of supplies they had been furnished with. Naturally, being highly civilised individuals with IQs above 300, they couldn't dream of eating each other. Even organising dinner parties that mixed geophysicists with biomolecular engineers was a nightmare. So, they formulated a plan of their own. Using the equipment at their disposal, they assembled a device that enabled them to create a temporal displacement field around the surface of the Earth. This field would send any sentient surface-dwelling life forms back through time to an era when they could prevent the destruction of the ozone layer. Unfortunately, the raptor called Nigel, in charge of the power, got a little carried away and sent them all back 60 million years where they eventually perished due to the appalling lack of takeaway restaurants in the Pleistocene and Jurassic eras. But not before they'd eaten all of George Hamilton's ancestors. And that's what happened to the dinosaurs we keep digging up. Honest. Bad days. We all have good days and bad days. Wouldn't it be useful if you had some way of knowing what kind of day it was going to be? Here are a few hints. You know it's going to be a bad day when Bruce Willis gets into the lift wearing a dirty t-shirt. You get so pissed that your head's spinning round and you know you're just about to throw up and you have to apologise to all your friends and pull over onto the hard shoulder. When the back of your coat gets caught in the tube doors as you're getting off. When you wake up somewhere official looking in Saudi Arabia with a hangover and a road cone when you turn up for a party in your normal clothes and then discover it's fancy dress. But no one notices. A beautiful foreign female secret agent thrusts a package into your hands as she's escaping from a group of gunmen and tells you to bring it to her bedroom that night. But you lose it. Aliens abduct you and ask you to have sex with one of their females and two weeks later their whole race dies of the clap. Just when you've finally got a date with the woman of your dreams, God appears and tells you you're the chosen one and you have to wander the earth in sackcloth and ashes trying to convince a bunch of unbelieving bastards that you're the new messiah. I hate it when that happens. Keith Chegwin turns up at your house at seven in the morning and tells you you're live on breakfast TV and you can't find anything heavy to hit the bastard with. You have a whirlwind romance, you're in the middle of a marriage ceremony, but as you're putting the ring on, you notice she's got webbed fingers. My biggest nightmare is waking up one morning and discovering that all this is a dream, and I really do live on Starbug. Children. Throughout history, children have always been the most frightening individuals on the planet. I went to school with them as a kid, and they were frightening then, but as an adult, they can really screw you up. This is because they're so honest, and also so inquisitive. There's a secret society that's trying to save adults from children. They leave important messages on everyday objects. I have a lighter with a sticker on it that reads, Keep out of reach of children. That's some seriously good advice, because they will mess you up. It's okay when they're little, they just pull your hair and crap on your trousers, but as soon as they can talk, they start asking those questions. The ones you can't answer. The ones that make you feel like a total blockhead because you know you should be able to answer them. They're only asking because they think you know everything. And of course, you let them think that. It makes you feel good. But all of a sudden, they come out with something like, You know, clouds. How do they stay up in the sky? Why don't they come down to the ground? And you smile and, and nod wisely. You pat them on the head and say, Well, you see, son, clouds are made of water vapour. And water vapour is denser than air, so... So they should come down to the ground. What the hell are they doing up there? They should be down here, for Christ's sake! And you realise you haven't got a clue. Why do they stay up there? You must have been bunking off school the day they did clouds, because you have no idea whatsoever. And while you're worrying about that, they hit you with a whole bunch of other impossible questions. Where does wind start? Where do all the flies go in winter? How does a microwave oven make things hot? If iron doesn't float, why don't all the ships sink? Where does a tree get all its wood from? Why is the sky always blue? Who wrote the Bible? Where do the songs on the radio go when you turn it off? How come we can see through glass if it's so hard? 
Kids can ask questions like this for hours on end, and they expect you to answer them because you're their dad, and you're supposed to be clever. You thought you were until this seven-year-old kid started asking all these ridiculously sensible questions. So you come up with that tired old grown-up excuse. Well, I could tell you, son, but you wouldn't understand. You're too young. Ask me in a couple of years' time. So they wait a couple of years. But by then, they've started to get intellectual. If Jesus was Jewish, why has he got a Mexican name? When you pour out boiling water, why does it sound different to cold water? If car tyres wear out, where does all the rubber go? So many perfectly reasonable questions, and you can't answer any of them. All of a sudden you realise that you don't know anything. So you ask your mates, and you realise they don't know anything either. You have to reconcile yourself to the fact that you're going to go through life as the guy that knows nothing about anything. You'll have recurring nightmares about your kid at school being asked by his friends, What's your dad like? And he says, Oh, he doesn't know anything. But it doesn't end there. They get a bit older, and they start coming out with all the really personal shit. Why did you start smoking if you knew it was bad for you? Why did you call people idiots when you're driving, when you don't even know them? Why did you drink alcohol at parties if you know it's going to make your head hurt in the morning, and you suddenly realise that you asked your father all the same stupid questions when you were a kid, and you suddenly understand what you must have put him through? So you phone him up. And you say sorry for the endless stupid questions you asked him when you were a kid. And he says, yeah, 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 fine. But what is it with the clouds? How the hell do they stay up there? Part two. Animals. This log would be woefully incomplete without an in-depth appraisal of our fellow creatures on the planet. Throughout mankind's history, animals have played a vital part in our development. In the early days, this largely consisted of us eating them, and also a fair amount of them eating us. There was nothing vindictive or malicious about this relationship, it's just that we were all hungry, and hunger is a great motivator. Animal Husbandry The concept of domesticating animals was invented by a group of hunter-gatherers with sore feet. Why, they opined, should we flog ourselves to death chasing extremely fast food across the tundra when we could simply stick a whole bunch of them in a pen and eat them when we're hungry? This was the birth of animal husbandry. Sadly, certain individuals took the phrase animal husbandry a little too literally and were shunned by their colleagues, especially if they got off with the best-looking sheep. Unless, of course, they are from Wales or New Zealand, where they would be applauded for their seduction techniques. Farms developed across the globe, and small villages grew up around them. Mankind nurtured his animals. He even gave them little pet names, like Christmas dinner and tomorrow's lunch. As our knowledge increased, farming became an exact science. However, one question was never answered, and probably never will be. Whereabouts on a chicken or its nuggets? The Missing Link one of the great unknowns in the development of mankind involves the search for the missing link, that intermediate stage linking modern man to the great apes. Of course, there is another major question in this area that needs answering. If we were descended from apes, why have we still got apes? Why didn't they evolve as well? Don't ask me. I haven't got a clue. Pets. One civilization caught on. A concept of keeping certain animals simply because they were nice to have around led to the theory of pets. Dogs were an early favourite because they could help us with the hunting, bark if we were threatened, and also because they seemed to like us. People are always going to hang around with anything that likes them. Domesticated dogs evolved from wolves, which used to hunt in packs, form territorial groups, and attack outsiders. So we had a lot in common. Also, they didn't taste too good, which, friendship aside, must have been an early consideration. The early Egyptians went one better. As well as employing hunting dogs, they liked to keep domestic cats around and even worship them, working on the theory that any life form that was so good-looking, independent and arrogant must have something going for it on a divine level. Thus, cats and dogs became mankind's animal companions of choice for all time. Your partner might leave you. Your feudal lord might imprison you and confiscate your eyeballs with a hot poker. But, rest assured, your faithful dog would howl forlornly outside your prison window, and your cat would wait faithfully by its bowl 
until someone else fed it. The keeping of cats and dogs became so much a part of our lives that many of their characteristics rubbed off on us, and their influence surreptitiously inspired many of the human traits that define our race. Pets. The whole concept is pretty bizarre when you think about it. The pets get somewhere to live, a carpet to mess up, and food. We get to provide the food. Dogs are supposed to be man's best friend. Would you take your best friend for a walk so he could crap in the street? My idea of a best friend is not one I have to feed every bloody day. If I throw a stick away, it's because I don't want it. The last thing I need is my best friend bringing it back all the time. You tell them to lie down, they lie down. You say sit, they sit. But if you say, oi, Rover, fix the starter motor on my car, they just bring you a sodding stick. That's not my idea of a best friend. It's not all the dog's fault, though. We do say some stupid things to them. Will you stop that bloody barking? And the dog looks up with his baffled dog face. What do you mean, stop barking? I'm a dog, it's what I do. Do you expect me to whistle Mozart? I've done sleeping and eating. I've done running round excitedly with my tongue hanging out. I've done humping the table leg. I've only got barking left. Then I can knock off for the day. God, it's a dog's life. Imagine if dogs ran the world and kept us as pets. Will you stop scratching at those little cards? God knows why they do it. I caught mine doing macrame on the living room carpet, so I rubbed his nose in it. And that disgusting thing mine does every time we've got company. I'm forever saying, don't worry, let it dry and it'll brush off. I said to him, if you do that again, I'll take you down the vets and have you done. And the look he gave me, well, you'd swear he could bark. Then there's cats. They're totally crap. I had a cat once. Every time it did something useful, I fed it. It died of starvation. Yeah, yeah, okay. They look cute. And people will say, oh, look at him. He likes you. He's purring. I don't know if it's just me, but I fail to see the attraction of a block-headed quadruped gargling phlegm. It's bad enough having dogs bring you bloody sticks all the time, but a cat's idea of a present is a partially dismembered pigeon twitching on the lino. Well, thanks a bunch, Tiddles. I'll treasure it always. At this point, I should like to share a theory with you. A theory that, whilst putting the cat amongst the pigeons, might also prove to be a dog in the manger. Please excuse the adult metaphors, they haven't been well. Theory time. Men and women are like dogs and cats. Obviously, one couldn't make a statement like that without justifying it. Not if one wanted to live. And I do. So here goes. Let's face it, men are dogs. This is not an insult nor a joke, but a carefully considered analogy. So, what's the plot? I'll tell you. There is no species on this earth that has so much in common with the male of our species than the dog. Let's analyse this. The dog is supposed to be man's best friend. Why do you think this is? The dog is irrationally faithful to those close to him, whether they deserve it or not. He likes nothing better than chasing a ball around a park. He loves to master tricks and then revel in the glory of approbation when these tricks are performed to a satisfactory degree. And when he's not eating, he's thinking about sex. Dog Nirvana is a simple place populated with balls, bowls and bottoms. I've actually got a very keen dog myself. I spent a couple of hours teaching them a trick. Then I went to bed. Four hours later, I was awoken by a noise in the lounge. I went downstairs and it was my dog, practicing. But I digress. Back to the plot. Consider this. Dogs chase cats, which brings us to another inescapable socio-anthropic conclusion. Women are cats. Women like to be pampered and fed. Women like to be stroked and cajoled, whined, dined and fawned over simply because they know they're superior to any other life form on the planet and deserve it. And guys, once you learn this, your life will become a great deal simpler. Whatever. Let's see how much further we can stretch this analogy. A dog will not think twice about being anywhere. A tree, a lamppost, a slow-moving leg. If they've got to go, they've got to go, and will cock a leg without a second thought. Have you ever seen a cat pee in the high street? No. Have you ever seen a woman pee in the high street? I rest my case. Cats are exotic, almost otherworldly beings who bestride the narrow world with poise and dignity. Lithe sculptures in flesh, drawing sighs of desire from the desperate dogs with their lolling tongues, crude barking jokes caught in their throats as these paragons of feline perfection slink by. Of course, I'm talking paradigms here. You get scraggy old moggies as much as you get scraggy old mongrels, but the basic tenet still holds. 
There are pedigrees and mongrels in both species, and as a rule, one often finds the mongrels to be far more amenable than the pedigrees. Now, cats and dogs both have claws, but only cats employ them as weaponry. Sound familiar? Although dogs are generally more powerful than cats, they almost invariably get slit up a treat in any cross-species encounters. Unless we're talking about Rottweilers or other nasty rough boys, in which case the cat will probably get bitten in half. At no stage did I claim that this was a perfect analogy, but I haven't wrung it dry yet. Ironically, one of the worst things you can call a woman is a dog. However, after a risque tale of sexual conquest, the phrase, you old dog, directed at a man, would be taken as a compliment. Also, dogs drool. Men have just about mastered their salivatory reflexes, but we still drool in our minds. Cats have an innate need to live within and perpetuate a clean, ordered environment. Dogs don't really give a shit, but will have one anywhere. They don't have litter trays. Have you ever noticed how long women spend in their neatly ordered powder rooms? Now, dogs evolved from wolves. Wolves are one of the few creatures that hang out with the guys and like to get together in teams and run about a lot. Cats are loners. If you take a dog down to the river, he will leap in with a joyful yelp and come galloping back through the noisome mud and deposit as much as possible on your shirt front in his enthusiasm for approval. This is a dog thing. On the whole, cats avoid such raucous behaviour. However, a cat will chase and kill the nearest bird for daring to look anywhere near as cute as the cat. Said bird will be deposited at your feet with an expression that could be translated as so you think it looks so cute now. Someone once likened two women at a cocktail party kissing to a pair of prize fighters touching gloves. This impression is not dissimilar to that conveyed when two cats meet for the first time. There is a certain amount of circling and sizing up involved. Danny John Jules, with a degree of help from Grant Naylor, has got the characterization of the cat down to a T. The cat lives in a world dominated by wardrobe, food and leisure. It's interesting that in the proposed American version of Red Dwarf, the cat was female. The vast majority of bar fights involve two men battling for the favours of a female in the manner of dogs fighting over a bone. When fighter pilots engage in the air, it's referred to as a dog fight. When women do battle, people refer to it as a cat fight. A brothel is often referred to as a cat house. When a man has upset his wife for some reason, he's in the dog house. The expression pussy has a definite female connotation. Dogs bury bones and are possessive about their toys. The only thing a cat will bury is that which is beneath its dignity to leave exposed. Cats are fastidious. Dogs are raucous and clumsy. Vive la difference. However, when my girlfriend reads this, she will probably claw my eyes out. Setting aside dogs and cats for a while, there are many other creatures on Earth worthy of note. The blue whale is the largest creature ever to have lived on the planet. The sad irony is that this noble creature was hunted to the edge of extinction to provide whalebone for the corsets of Victorian ladies who wished to conceal their own whale-like proportions from the populace. I used to be very fond of whales. In fact, I even did a charity gig for Save the Whale. It raised enough money to save a whole school of them. Then, a week later, I got mugged, and that one of the fat bastards turned up to help me out. So now, I do gigs for Save the Plankton. There's a lot of nonsense talked about whales, and I'd like to put the record straight on a few points. That enigmatic whale song, it's just indigestion. If you spend all day hoovering up millions of tiny little prawns, you're bound to get a duff one now and then. Also, not many people know that whales are, in fact, descended from birds. Those little flappy things on the side aren't flippers, they're vestigial wings. A throwback to the time when whales would swoop and soar majestically on the primeval air currents, frightening the slower-moving dinosaurs who lived in abject terror of an airborne cetacean bowel movement. Things were good for the whales until one fateful day, as they were roosting in a couple of winded, creaking trees, one of them said, Anyone for a swim? And it was all over. Also, those blowholes whales sport on the backs of their heads. Many scholars assume that they're concerned with respiration. Wrong! They are, in fact, a weapon the whales use in their desperate attempts to catch seagulls because they're so thoroughly fed up with seafood. So now you know. As time went on, a lot of interesting animals appeared on Earth. 
Interesting in the way a laughing poodle with hands would be interesting. Time flies. During the 21st century, common houseflies had to evolve faster and faster ways of avoiding or increasingly accurate attempts to swat them. By 2250, the survivors gradually developed the ability to make short hops through time. These hops became longer and longer, until a mutant species of flies developed with the ability to fly through time at will. Tempers frayed as humans failed to swat these elusive creatures, and the expression, fuggy, was often heard as yet another time fly evaded a swift demise. Power Saw a genetically engineered creature created to fight in the Thai Wars of the 23rd century. The power saws were 10 foot tall, Tyrannosaurus Rex type creatures with biological chainsaws instead of arms. These limbs were muscle powered and used revolving tendons to drive serrated teeth around a flat bony plate. Their task was to charge the enemy at 40 miles per hour and cut the heads off. This was considered a highly effective way of demoralizing an enemy force. It also tended to prevent them from thinking, eating, and in fact, living. One of the more interesting aspects of the power source was that due to a peculiar quirk in their genetic programming, they all spoke like Oscar Wilde. Not a cat. Not a cats were the result of an early genetics experiment conducted in the same lab that brought us power source. This experiment produced a whole bunch of seriously screwed up creatures that resembled ordinary house cats, except they were incredibly strong, vicious and cunning. Unfortunately, a number of them escaped and bred prolifically. They got their name from the most common phrase used in their presence, usually in the form of famous last words. Not a cat! Swanophants. Unfortunately, alcohol affects genetic engineers as much as the next person, and some of the more eccentric DNA combinations occurred under the influence. The swanophant was a drunken attempt to combine the grace of a swan with the big of an elephant. They ended up with a huge grey bastard of a thing covered in feathers that had a beaky head on the end of its trunk and massive purple webbed feet. It wasn't particularly graceful, but it certainly broke the ice at parties, as did the duck-billed rhinoceros, the ard bear, the chimpanzebra, the albatrox not one to be sunbathing under, the spiny dog-eater, the grizzly gerbil, the jellyfinch, the bird-eating bird, which didn't last long, and the cricket bat, which was only created to get a cheap laugh out of the name. Fortunately, after a massive hundred-legged whale appeared, escaped and trampled a coach full of nuns, a total ban on alcohol was introduced in genetic research labs. Part 3. Some very good advice for anyone that reads this book. It's impossible to know what life forms might eventually find this chronicle of mankind's development over the millennia. But for the sake of posterity, I should like to pass on a few salient pieces of advice. Advice based on personal and often painful experiences gleaned during a life that most sentient life forms might describe as not entirely uneventful. Some of this advice will only be relevant to bipedal life forms with two sexes, but much of it will apply to any alien race with the ability to understand such concepts as grief, Severe grief, pain, rejection, and deli belly. But rest assured, every word of this advice has been garnered from numerous catastrophic experiences in some of the less salubrious sectors of the space-time continuum. So, ignore it at your peril. The concept of giving advice is a very human trait. At its best, it was a way for the older, wiser members of a community to pass on their hard-earned wisdom in order to save their offspring the grief and suffering they endured when they were young and stupid. At its worst, it was a way for loud-mouthed, opinionated old busybodies to get on everyone's nerves by trying to tell people they didn't know how to do things they knew nothing about ad nauseum. However, good advice is always welcome if it comes from a legitimate source. If you want to learn the violin, listen to Yehudi Menuhin. But if you want to change a plug, don't listen to a guy with no eyebrows. Unfortunately, taking advice is a very unhuman trait. Generation after generation decides to do it their own way, which is basically the same way their parents did it, only in more ridiculous clothes. Parental advice is pretty much ignored by young humans for three reasons. One, parents don't know anything because they're old. Two, grown-ups are obviously doing something wrong because the planet is in such a dreadful state. And three, 
I want to have sex all the time. And you're making it as difficult as possible without chaining me up in a wardrobe and feeding me homework through the keyhole. To be honest, throughout history, number three has always been the big problem. Lesser life forms on Earth, such as rats and politicians, merely followed a biological imperative and mated with anything that would stay still long enough. Whereas, humans invented so many rules about mating that it was a miracle any of us got close enough to wave, let alone have sex. However, I digress. These snippets of wisdom, dear listener, could well save you from a shark-infested ocean of grief, pain and embarrassment, especially the one involving the vacuum cleaner. They are in no particular order, because grief and bleakness tend to arrive haphazardly and unannounced themselves. General advice. Don't keep anything radioactive in your pants. Women find genitals that glow in the dark strangely disturbing for some reason. Don't, under any circumstances, put your head in anything that has head remover written on it. Or you could end up like my old friend Shorty No Head Wainwright. If your girlfriend has her hair done, never ever tell her you liked it better the way it was before. Don't have silicon breast implants, unless you're a woman. Don't head out to sea on a windsurfer until you've learned to turn around. Don't ever think a cheap second-hand parachute with a sign on it saying, only used once, is a bargain. Never give an Australian your address, because he'll come and live with you forever. Avoid using the phrase, I don't think you've got the nerve to pull that trigger when someone is pointing a gun at you. Don't get into a bollock kicking contest with Vinnie Jones, not even if he lets you go first. Learn to distinguish between licorice and high tensile safety rope before going on a space walk. If a Rottweiler starts humping your leg, fake an orgasm. Never put a certain part of your anatomy into a household appliance, not even the Hoover. If a heavily made-up woman approaches you in the street and says she'll do anything you want for 50 quid, ask her to paint your house. Avoid exotic sex toys. A friend of mine was making love to an inflatable doll and her inflatable husband arrived and seriously put the wind up him. If you get stuck in a bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic jam and you want to save money, turn off the engine and let the guy behind you push you. Don't go to a restaurant where the napkins are made of better material than your jacket. If you ever end up owning a pet shop, teach all the parrots to say, I miss my little brother. You'll sell a lot more that way. If you lend someone a fiver and never see them again, it was worth it. Don't go for a haircut when you're drunk. If someone steals your car, make sure you get their number. If you're driving in LA and the smog gets so bad you can't breathe, Simply crash the car on purpose and suck on the airbag until help arrives. Ugly people, if you want to get laid, try to find a beautiful woman who wants to spite her husband. Don't play frisbee in a dog pound. Always get married in the morning. That way, if it doesn't work out, you haven't ruined the whole day. Don't do what I did and lend a friend £3,000 for plastic surgery, because now I can't recognise him. If you want to find out whether someone is stupid or not, Tell them a light year is a year that has 40% less calories than a regular year. If they say, really, they're stupid. Always remember, most kinds of trouble start off as fun. Don't try to understand Einstein's theory of relativity. Relativity is like an erection. The more you think about it, the harder it gets. At a party, don't hide in the fridge for a laugh. Bad idea. Don't force your head into a saucepan and pretend to be a Dalek to amuse a kid. They only start laughing when you can't get it off. Always remember, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But so is ugly. Don't believe scuttleless rumours, like the one claiming that doctors only slap newborn babies to knock the willies off the smart ones. If a woman tells another woman that she looks a million, she doesn't mean dollars, she means years old. Don't go scuba diving with a friend who's greedy, because if your air supply gives up at 90 feet, he'll be going, No, you can't have any of this. This is mine. Never let a pissed mate sort your back out by doing something he saw an osteopath do on telly.
And girls, it's okay to laugh in the bedroom, but don't point while you're doing it. Never buy sushi out of a vending machine. If you hear the toilet flush and a child's voice going, oh, oh, it's already too late. Never shake an iguana. Don't test the mains lead with your tongue. If you phone up one of those cards you see in phone boxes, don't expect to meet the girl in the picture. Oops. Don't agree to go rollerblading with your kid until you've had at least two hours practice on your own wearing a suit of armour. If you're going to use an aerosol with anything dodgy in it, it'll have instructions telling you what to do if you get it in your eyes. Read this before you use it. Because once you've got an eyeful, you won't be able to see a bloody thing. If you're swimming in a lake in Africa and two crocodiles grab your arms up to the shoulder, clap your hands together sharply and that'll stun them. Advice about sex. It's always tricky giving advice to people about sex, just in case they suddenly look at you all icky and go, you don't really do that, do you? Whatever. I've never been one to avoid a challenge through fear of embarrassment. I mean, look at my career, for God's sake. So here goes. Advice about sex. It's a sad fact that familiarity can breed complacency. The only difference between having a job for ten years and having a wife for ten years is that after ten years, most jobs still suck. They say that there is one perfect partner for everyone on the planet. Unfortunately, 99% of the male population are convinced it's Claudia Schiffer. So I wouldn't want to be here. Well, maybe just for one night. Whatever. On with the advice. There are a number of things you should never do during sex. Women, you should never answer the phone and chat, eat, look at your watch, file your nails, file your tax returns, talk about marriage, especially on a fair state, or fall asleep and snore. Men, during sex, you should never answer the phone and tell someone what you're doing, blow your nose, whistle, think that to be a winner in the sex stakes, you have to finish first all the time, call someone else to see if they want to join in, fumble with the remote control for the camcorder, visibly, chew her underwear, shout a running commentary about what you're doing to your friends across the street. Or try to get her to do that thing her sister did that really turns you on.